development of autonomous technologies. So as shown on that slide, the simulation environment, the driver, the vehicle, and the environment are usually um, are, are virtual, and therefore the testing takes place in a virtual environment. To be more precise, there are also simulation approaches existing that involve the driver or the hardware or even the vehicle. And we'll discuss that um, and these different simulation methods in more detail in a few minutes. So now let's dive into the virtual testing process in more detail. So that slide illustrates an example of how a generic simulation framework may fit within a holistic testing and validation process. The data sources block shown um, uh, or shows that simulation scenarios can come from various sources, such as data gathering during public road testing, existing test track procedures, or even crash databases. So in addition to the scenarios, static as well as dynamic content, such as road markings, speed limits, traffic signs, but also weather and environmental conditions have to, pick, have to be considered for processing. And then in the simulation, the system and the vehicle response are now calculated with the mentioned input parameters. And the simulation results are then processed and interpreted accordingly. That's what you can see on the right side of that slide um, when it is mentioned output. So to make it a little more pragmatic with an example, if you now think about, an, let's take an active brake assistant system. So some of the input parameters would be the velocity of the vehicle under test, as well as the velocity of the potential collision object as well as both positions of these objects. Also, it's important to have the input data, how the driver reacts in that situation. For example, if the driver starts steering, starts braking during that event. And the simulation will then tell you on how the system would react in that exact uh, situation. For example, if the system triggers the active brake assist or not. And the output will then be used for validation. For example, to decide if the system has reacted correctly or not. Of course, that's only a very simplified example and the input data as well as the whole simulation model itself can become very, very complex and extensive. Slide please. So, um, as earlier mentioned, mostly the simulation are done in a completely virtual environment, but a useful way of using simulation also is to combine them with physical models. That's often called as X in the loop simulation. And the most common X in the loop approaches for testing of autonomous vehicle systems are software in the loop, hardware in the loop, driver in the loop, and vehicle in the loop. So starting from the left side of that slide with software in the loop, software in the loop is a way to test some components of ADA software. So by using software in the loop, developers can check if the code performance in a simulated environment without the actual hardware parts. While hardware in the loop approach, that means that using a real-time simulation for checking a vehicle's hardware, so in a typical hardware in the loop testing process, a hardware test unit operates in a simulated environment. Now driver in the loop simulation happens when real people drive a simulated vehicle that has a controlled similar to a real vehicle and operates in a virtual environment. So this approach supports using input from human drivers for the development of ADAS even before the actual car is ready. And lastly, with the vehicle in the loop method, a real autonomous vehicle and a human driver inside it operate in a simulated environment. So the vehicle drives in the virtual traffic either by itself or controlled by the driver when needed. For example, it's good when evaluating warning systems and how people would react to them. Next slide, please. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of simulation? 
First of all, simulation is a very HL approach. So if you have to set up a simulation environment, um, and if you have set up the environment and then change, for example, only one parameter, like uh, you'll immediately get the results. As an example, if you decelerate at eight meter per second squared, instead of six meter per second squared, what impact does this have? Or if you simply change the friction of your tires or the weather conditions, this can also have an impact on the behavior of your automated system. A second advantage of simulation is that simulation is very controllable. So you can change a parameter in a very simple and controllable way. For example, changing the friction of the road surface. So in real world, you would have to have different roads and or change the friction, for example, by making the road wet. And thirdly, simulation can be used in a very cost effective and efficient way. So this means that you don't need the physical objects and equipment like vehicles, targets, and so on. Also testing can be done at any time. You're not depending on weather or lighting conditions. And also simulation is the safest way of testing compared to physical testing because the test is performed in a virtual environment and there are no hazards to objects, people, or the environment. And lastly, Simulation comes with a very high repeatability and reproducibility. So once you have created your simulation, you can run exactly the same tests thousands of millions of times. So if the system under test and your simulation do not change, you'll get exactly the same results. However, there are also kind of challenges and disadvantages to simulation. So one of the challenges that simulation usually does not uncover edge cases and unknown unknowns. So in your simulation, you simulate exactly what is entered as the input parameter. If you therefore forget an important input parameter and do not take it into account in the simulation, you'll not discover its influence. Another challenge is the limitation by current state of modeling fidelity. So for example, in real life, it can make a huge difference which tire has been mounted on the vehicle. And if this is not exactly reflected in the simulation model with the identical tire model, the simulation result can deviate from the real test. But as mentioned at the beginning, simulation is only an uh, efficient and effective tool when it is used in conjunction with physical testing. And in the following, Lucas will explain more about the test track testing. Thanks, Stefan. So as you mentioned, sort of the next step uh, logically after simulation is uh, in progress would be to do test track testing, where you would use the real subject vehicle uh, with trained or lay drivers on the test track. As you can see here, the, the sort of disadvantage we already see is that we are missing a real world environment. So the advantages of test track, track testing, uh, like I mentioned, includes that we are testing with the real physical hardware and vehicle dynamics of the intent uh, to release. So, right, you might see differences in controller latency, communication latency, even chassis latency, right, how quickly the, the subject vehicle can actually, for example, build brake pressure and control the vehicle versus your simulation. Uh, and that learned in experience can also be re -imp -imp inputted into your simulation to better inform that testing. Uh, you could also do the same, you know, if it's not maybe vehicle latency specific, but other things about the way the sensors are actually behaving in the real world could be input to the simulation. It is obviously a little bit riskier than simulation because it's real cars on the road uh, on test track, but it's definitely significantly safer than, than on the real road because you can control the participants on your proving ground, you can control the training of all of the other drivers on the proving ground, and like we'll get into, you can use uh, guided soft targets that basically present no damage or harm if they're struck uh, in a test. <laughs> 
And then uh, the final pro I would say is that it allows for the testing and recreation of very specific scenarios. So you know maybe you you thought up a scenario that would be challenging to your vehicle. You could easily set up uh, a real test of that on the proving ground. Or if you saw something uh, in the real world that you wanted to verify your performance on with a new software version or a new sensor, you could implement that on your proving ground uh, relatively easily. The sort of disadvantages here are increased cost. So you have to cope with you know, several expensive test prototype vehicles with the maintenance and construction of a proving ground, or in some cases, the rental of somebody else's proving ground. You also have to sort of put up with the limited randomness, right? The, the tests you're going to do are, for the most part, only as good as what you're thinking to do. So kind of like Chefon mentioned, right, there, you're missing unknown unknowns uh, if you're doing a good job of, of test track testing. Uh, next is lower fidelity. So you know you might have real tires on the car, but you you could be missing other road users that you might see in the real world that aren't represented by the equipment you have at your test track. Uh, so right, weird objects in the road or weirdly shaped vehicles uh, would be difficult to recreate. Next, you're limited by the existing infrastructure that you have at your proving ground. So you know different facilities have different options and different, for example, top speeds that you could do on a specific pad. Uh, so some tests may not even be uh, testable in certain proving ground situations. And finally, there are always small unanticipated variations. And I would consider this a little bit of a pro too, because you can't control everything about the, the environment in your test track, right? The sun could be in a different position, also in different times of the year. Uh, you can't control the weather, you can control the surface wetness, but you can't really control the temperature and things like that at your proving ground. So I wanted to show basically three examples of scenarios from our testing that I would say are great examples of things that you really could only do on test track that you would never be able to recreate naturally on the real road. So the first thing you're gonna wanna look at is that there's going to be a, a guided soft target coming from the left of this scene. Uh, and this is basically a strikeable robotic uh, cyclist. So it's meant to model the, the camera qualities and the radar qualities of a real cyclist. But early in the development, if your feature is not for example, responding correctly to the cyclist, you don't pose any damage or risk by striking it. So in the scenario, you'll see our subject car is going to come from the right side and is making a left directly towards our camera when suddenly a cyclist will appear from the left and the car has a very limited amount of time to perceive the object because you'll see in this scene, it comes from behind this barricade so it needs to perceive the object, it needs to guess where it's going to be when the car is going to be there, and then it needs to act to control the chassis. So this is a particularly challenging scenario just because of how quickly everything needs to happen, and also because of where the cyclist is coming from, you have sort of limited sensor visibility as it comes from the side of the car. This example basically has a running pedestrian, I would guess easily distracted by maybe an ice cream truck, is running parallel to the path of the car when he suddenly basically comes directly into our eco car's trajectory. So here, like men Melanie mentioned, right, it's really important to, to always be modeling correct velocities and accelerations for other objects that our eco car is uh, perceiving, right? And in this case, it, it needs to fairly quickly change from, right, this, this runner who's running parallel to me is not on a crash course with me to, right, he suddenly turned, turned left and he's now relevant to my trajectory and then obviously make the correct commands onto the car. Right, this is another example though of where the timing, like Stefan mentioned, right, a false positive braking event could be as risky as a false negative, right? So if you're just, for example, driving past a running pedestrian and he doesn't actually run into your path you know, a full braking event could also be hazardous to other road users. So you really need to make sure that you're doing it at really the last possible moment. Um, and that's also very dependent on, right, the way the car can brake, the tires that are it's equipped with, um, and parameters like this. The final event is, is very hard to, to see on the real road, 
Um, and it basically includes a high speed crossing event where there's really only a very small parameter of this situation where you would actually strike this guided soft target vehicle. Um, and all of the other ones would be sort of false reactions by the system. So this example basically shows use of a high speed guided target uh, very closely calibrated with the dynamics of our car and the movement of our car. Uh, and you see on the back, basically right there, some installed uh, equipment that's sort of coordinating the behavior of both the guided soft target, and in some cases could be coordinating the behavior of our eco car, uh, such that right their speeds are lined up and that they're on a, a collision course. And you would also run right cases of this where maybe there's a a near miss by a meter to try to make sure that your system's not overreactive and posing more risk to other road users uh, than it should be. And now I'll hand it off to Melanie uh, with some real world testing. Yeah, now that we have already learned quite a lot about the simulation and test testing, I want to give you a short overview um, about real world testing. Of course, as the name already says, in that uh, case, we have a real driver, a real vehicle, and the real environment. Just as with the other two testing methods, of course, also real world testing has its pros and cons. One very obvious, but at the same time, one of the most important um, advantages of real world testing is that you're operating the vehicle in the real operating environment. So as mentioned, you have like a real driver, you have the real uh, vehicle, um, you have the real environment. So basically whenever something happens, you don't have to question uh, if that was due to an incorrect model or a driving behavior you would not see uh, on the road because whatever you see in, in real world testing, that's just the truth. Um, with real world testing, you basically automatically um, test a lot of variables that you can encounter on in real world. Um, for example, different weather conditions or different visibility conditions. Um, one very important point is you have real other traffic participants uh, and their real behavior, um, because that's something that is sometimes pretty hard to model in a simulation or um, to model it on a test track. Um, and that's like a very important uh, point for our um, systems to react uh, correctly to, of course. Also, you have, of course, the real road and real road infrastructure, which means you have like a huge variety of different pavement styles, or maybe you also have, for example, a traffic sign that is not in perfect shape. And just basically by testing in real world, you automatically um, test a lot of those variables our customers will encounter as well. Um, with this uh, many variables you're testing in, in the real world, um, this is also pretty good to reveal edge cases and system limitations. So if you drive on real world uh, real roads, as already mentioned, sometimes you have, for example, the behavior of other traffic participants that you did not expect like that before. Um, which could lead to edge cases or um, could reveal system limitations. Um, one other um, pretty big benefit from real world testing is that you can do real world testing in combination with the so-called shadow mode um, to gain trust and experience with systems. That basically means that you could deactivate, for example, strong steering or braking reactions and just have a trigger in the background. And whenever the system would react, the trigger would um, do a recording and you can analyze afterwards if that was the one that would have been the wanted behavior or not. Of course, real world testing does not only have its pros, it also has quite some um, disadvantages. It's on the one side, very time consuming and expensive. Um, you need to have like the special equipped vehicle, you have you need to have the driver and you need to drive um, usually quite a significant amount of miles. Also, it's unrepeatable, uncontrollable and unpredictable. So that's like a huge difference to the other two um, testing methods we saw. So for real world testing, basically whatever happens, happens. Um, your 
ability to influence what you uh, experience or what you detect or see uh, on real roads is very limited. So it's hard to tell the other drivers around you how they should behave or which maneuvers they should perform. It's just, yeah, whatever happens, happens. Um, another thing that is, of course, a disadvantage from real-world testing is that the system must be safe before you can drive it on public roads. So basically, whenever um, there is just a software change, you can't just jump into the car and drive the um, car on public roads. So you first have to make sure that the software is safe to drive. So the following video is actually, as you can already see, a, a video from a test track uh, maneuver, but still I think it shows pretty well why real-world testing is so important. I think Lucas has already uh, kind of like mentioned that topic, that our systems have to be pretty robust for everything that can happen on real roads. And this scenario is a scenario that most of us encounter basically each day in um, on real roads, just two cyclists driving behind each other and a car passes them. Just in the very last moment, something happens which makes the system to intervene. So they're driving and now the cyclist is basically cutting in into the lane of the um, test vehicle and the system detects it pretty quick and has to react super fast to, in this case, even avoid the collision. So if you think of that maneuver, also when you think of like how it looked like when the car approached the two cyclists, this is really like a normal situation and just all of a sudden some inches and small differences in the behavior make a huge difference for the wanted um, system reaction. So that shows that, for example, it's super important to pass just how cyclists drive in real world. Um, maybe they're also like uh, weaving in their lane or, um, are not driving like super accurate in their bike, bike lane. Um, and still in most cases, you don't want the system to issue like a full braking reaction for a cyclist that is just driving next to you. Um, but that's something that is very important to train your system to and to make it robust for, and still not to lose the use case like the one we have just seen here um, in this test track maneuver. Another important benefit from real world testing is that you can of course use the data you collected in real world and feed it back into simulation or test back testing. That's something that is um, very important, very useful also to get an impression of like how would a system react um, if the this, if this situation might have been slightly different. So you could take the data you gather from real world testing and just maybe um, change the velocity a little bit and then analyze how the behavior would be or also if you did software changes to check um, how the system would behave after those uh, software changes in a real world scenario. Of course, you could also use it as like inspiration for test track testing. Um, here again, like this human driving behavior um, comes into play. For example, if you had a um, scenario with a very interesting driving behavior from like maybe another traffic participant, you could basically use that um, experience and try to uh, reproduce it on the test track. Um, test tra uh, real world testing is also not just real world testing. There are also different phases for real world testing. Uh, most car makers, I would say, um, use. I guess most of you are familiar with the V process. So that's um, basically the V development process, which starts with uh, a concept phase, um, then goes over in the main development implementation phase and um, ends with the approval testing and validation phase. In general, real-world testing can mainly be found on the right side of the V. Um, so basically in the development and validation, verification, and approval phase. Usually the first real-world testing that happens is uh, expert testing, where basically professionally trained um, development engineers would um, test their software on the road. And also there are different phases uh, within the expert testing. For example, often it's the case that at first, um, someone would have a look at sensor performance. 
So check if the camera, for example, detects the objects correctly or the lane markings correctly. And as a second step, um, it would then be verified that also the system that reacts on those objects um, performs correctly as wanted. As wanted. Once the expert testing uh, was successful, and of course, uh, some other tests, um, usually what happens, um, we would have a field operational test that basically means um, we have, again, professionally trained drivers um, who would drive a lot of miles with the systems. Goal here is to also gain the statistical trust in the, um, the systems. So you really drive a lot of miles and you get a feeling of like how robust um, those systems work in the field. Once all those testing phases have been successful, um, the last phase often is some kind of customer-oriented on-road validation. That basically means a testing phase where um, test subjects would drive the systems who are no experts and not that familiar with the systems. Um, and usually those cars are still equipped with a measurement system, so they could still like trigger whenever there was something um, they thought wasn't ideal. And also um, at the end, they would have to give feedback like how they um, dealt with the system. Already talking about approval and verification and validation, I now hand it over to Stefan, who will talk a little bit about the regulatory topics with respect to ADAS and automated driving. All right, thanks. So in the next few minutes, I'll provide an overview regarding the regulatory requirements. So in general, it's important to know that regulations are created to protect the environment, the safety, and others to ensure a minimum standard for products and services. And that slide provides an idea on the technology roadmap versus the regulatory roadmap. So when talking about regulations and standards, it's important to know that we differentiate between industry standards and our best practices, as well as regulations. So regulations are mandatory regulatory requirements that have been introduced at a country level or even sometimes go beyond like uh, UN ECE regulations for all UN ECE member states. Um, while industry standards are standards that have been developed and published by the industry and standardization bodies, and those are not always automatically mandatory. So often these industry standards are referenced in regulations. As an example, here it's uh, the ISO 26262 for functional safety or the ISO 21434 um, for cybersecurity. And as shown on that slide, and that should be the message of that slide, is that regulations and standards often lag behind technologies in their development. So that's a challenge because as mentioned, regulations and standards are an essential part of the safe introduction of new products and technologies. So now let's move on um, onto the US federal and state regulations for operating on autonomous vehicles on public roads for testing purpose, purposes, or even for the public use. And I'll focus in the next slides more on autonomous uh, vehicles. So level three, level four, level five vehicles. So generally speaking, we need to divide this again into regulations from the US level um, or the US federal government and regulations from the individual US states. So the US federal level shown here on the left side regulates the safety of motor vehicles and its systems and components. The agency called NHTSA or the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration specifies here the minimum safety performance requirements for vehicles and equipments called FMVSS, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. So before deploying a vehicle in the United States, manufacturers need to comply with all the applicable FMVSS requirements. But also NHTSA can approve a limited number of exemptions from the FMVSS. As an example, if a vehicle without mirrors, um, as it has an automated driving systems and no need for mirrors. The US states shown here on the right side 
regulate the licensing and the use. So for example, driver license, vehicle registration, tax, insurance, and so on. So states basically should follow also the recommendations from the federal level and the federal government when drafting legislation. Unfortunately, and that's what you can see on the next slide, that's not always the case. So let me give you a brief insight into the requirements for autonomous vehicles registration at the state level. So the background color of each state indicates what type of automated driving um, on public roads the law or the regulations allows. The states colored here in blue, such as California, Nevada, Arizona, and so on, allow the deployment of automated vehicles on public roads. The states colored in yellow, such as Washington, New York, allow testing of automated vehicles on public roads. And the states colored in orange, like Michigan and Pennsylvania, they allow the use of automated vehicles, but limit to a certain vehicles on public roads. And those colored in gray are still a little behind or they have not specified any statement on that yet. So if we now look at the US map, it becomes clear that some of the states they have already approved the deployment of autonomous vehicles on public roads and some haven't. And in addition to that, it's also important to note that there are additional prerequisites regarding um, having a safety driver inside the vehicle or not. So some of the states, they require to have a safety driver on the driver's seat or passenger seat, and some of them, they don't require to have a safety driver. So in summary, it can be said that the states vary greatly with regard to the deployment of autonomous vehicles. Also, it should be noted that this differs significantly from other countries in the world, as not every country allows autonomous vehicles on public roads. So now that we have looked into the different requirements on individual states, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the federal level. So currently, um, if we look at the federal level, there are no implemented regulations, but there are voluntary guidelines. So in general, the US federal guidelines provide a framework for voluntary safety self-assessment, also called VSSA, best practices, guidance to the states, but also they prepare the way for fully autonomous vehicles through these guidelines. And over the past several years, these guidelines have been introduced. Um, they don't replace each other, but rather build on each other. The most recent guideline is called AV Comprehensive Plan, shown here on the upper left part of this slide. And the AV Comprehensive Plan basically defines three goals to achieve US DOT's vision for automated driving systems. The first goal is to promote collaboration and transparency. So for example, with public access to information regarding the capabilities and limitations of automated driving systems. Secondly, to modernize the regulatory environment. As an example, to modernize regulations and remove unintended and unnecessary barriers to innovate vehicle design, features, and operational models. And lastly, to prepare the transportation system. For example, to conduct the foundational research demonstration activities needed to safely evaluate and integrate automated driving systems. Besides the mentioned US guidelines, um, in June 2020, NHTSA also launched the AV test initiative. And the goal of the initiative is to provide the public with direct and easy access to information about testing of ADAS equipped vehicles. And this will increase the public awareness of on-road testing safety precautions, and also principles guiding the testing. Next slide. So in my last slide for today, I'd like to summarize our presentation and give you an outlook. So first of all, it's expected that a balanced mix of simulation in virtual environment, driving on closed test tracks, 
and driving on public roads will also be required as part of the certification process to safely deploy ADAS and autonomous vehicles. Another trend that we see is creating transpar transparency of these new technologies to increase customers' trust and acceptance. So this was supported by initiatives, as I just mentioned, uh, the introduced initiative by NHTSA, which is called the AV test initiative. And last but not least, we also expect increasing global harmonization of regulations and standards. Also modernizing the regulatory environment, as earlier mentioned, such as improving existing standards and developing new requirements, regulations, and standards regarding autonomous vehicles and ADAS. And that will also be key to success. So with that, we hope you enjoyed the presentation and that it was insightful for you. And we thank you very much and uh, we are happy to answer any open questions. Okay, guys, we thank you for this wealth of information. Uh, as we all know, building trust with the consumer is probably the primary focus of uh, these ADAS systems. So I think right now would be a great time to open it up for Q&A. Uh, we have some questions in the queue from some of our participants, and I don't think these are focused at anyone in particular. So uh, if anyone of you three want to take a stab at them, uh, feel free. So the first question is, uh, how close is simulation validation compared to real world testing? I think it really depends on uh, which simulation exactly you're talking about and also what the goal of the simulation is. There are quite a lot of different levels of simulation from like very simple, simplified simulations that just give you an idea of how a system would react to very advanced simulations with uh, huge computers in the background, or maybe as Stefan mentioned, even a hardware in the loop or um, even like a driving simulator where it's, it's much more close to the reality. Um, and that really depends on what you use the simulation for and how close it has to be to the real world. So it's, it's difficult to answer this uh, question just generally. It really depends on the use case and the goal of the simulation as well. Okay. Also, I wanted to add just that simulation basically has been used for decades already for R&D. So it's, it's nothing which was kind of introduced over the last few months. Um, rather, simulation was already used over the last uh, decades. So um, as Melanie mentioned, it really depends on, on what kind of simulation you use um, for what kind of purpose. Um, and also it's important to note that at the end, as, as we mentioned earlier, um, it, it comes back to that mix of simulation, um, um, public uh, road testing, as well as closed course testing. Um, that's quite an important factor on how accurate simulation is. Okay, thank you. Melanie and Stefan, uh, can you please elaborate on what has been done to address variations in role users' behavior from different parts of the world? Um, so basically that's, oh, uh, is it me? No, no, it is. <laughs> um, that's actually one reason why we are where we are in Long Beach. <laughs> Um, the main development does take place in Germany, and we have tested this all around the world to exactly analyze that and see um, how well our system systems can cope and deal with different behavior, different driving behaviors all around the world. So we have the test center, for example, in the U.S. Um, to see if there are significant uh, differences between, for example, the U.S. and Germany, where the main um, development takes place. Um, and also we have, for example, a test center in China because um, of course uh, the traffic situation in China is significantly different than what we might know from the US or Germany. Um, and that's basically, their testing is extremely important to see if our systems can already cope with uh, those differences or if maybe even country specific um, adaptions are required. 
Okay. This is a pretty good one. Uh, if a vehicle has aftermarket modifications regarding suspension, tires, wheels, et cetera, uh, does a repair facility or service center need to recalibrate the ADAS system to ensure it functions properly? Yeah, that's definitely, yeah, go, for it, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> that's definitely a, a very good question. Um, and it's also not that easy uh, to answer, I would say. Um, I think one very important point was already mentioned here. Um, it's important to make sure afterwards that the systems are still uh, working properly. Um, it really depends on what this modification is. Um, for example, the window tint, if that's like the tint in front of like one of our cameras, that's of course a modification that is pretty difficult to, um, to solve. <laughs> And also, for example, the camera would need to be recalibrated. Um, for topics like that, it's it's really the most important point here is that the consumer actually thinks of that and goes to the workshop and asks for help, <laughs> um, because that's basically impossible to uh, manage without the necessary equipment. But also, our systems would recognize um, they have like some some methods implemented that they would, for example, the camera would realize uh, if it's completely decalibrated and complain <laughs> that um, it would need to be calibrated professionally. Okay, anything there, Lucas? Or... No, I think that's-, that's Leave uh, it there, okay. The one, uh, one thing I would say is that in, in many cases, I think vehicle modifications should be treated effectively as uh, disadvantaging these systems and in many cases deeming them inoperable uh, right there's there's not a great interface with some modifications for these changes to then be made in the car because they haven't been you know gone through that entire validation, validation phase that that the oem did right correct correct okay and also just to add so as an example if you change your classing um um, with an aftermarket glassing, um, you are or the, you basically, the, the company who changed the glass, they are required to recalibrate it if you have ADA sensors. Um, so that's, that's a requirement the, the shop needs to do. So they need to recalibrate your cameras and, and sensors which have been impacted by the change of the glassing to make sure that the systems are working properly afterwards. So depending on, on the part you are changing, there are definitely requirements if you change essential parts, which have an impact on the functionality of the systems. Okay, great. Another interesting question. Do you use machine learning for monitoring real users to train your systems or produce more natural reactions? If so, why or why not? So uh, in general, machine learning is of course a topic that um, is more and more important. And uh, one area where I think it, it's pretty obvious that it is important is for example, uh, to train a camera um, in particular, because the variations you can find on the street of like how cars look like, how pedestrians look like, how other road infrastructure looks like um, is so various that you basically need to have some kind of artificial intelligence um, to make it like more human to detect uh, whatever a traffic sign, for example, is or uh, what a pedestrian is. So for topics like that, um, machine learning is already pretty widely spread, I would say. Okay, anything else to add from either of you guys? Or? Bear with me because the questions are, are rolling in. Uh, most accidents occur from distracted driving, like texting. Do you have sensors that can tell if a driver is distracted or give an audio, audible or visual warning? I guess this one is for us. Um, <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, right, I think. The system does monitor for attention and right there's several measures in place to try to make sure that the driver is in the loop 
but there's nothing currently in place to, to look for a cell phone and call it out. Okay. Um, I saw a question regarding LiDAR, LiDAR technology. Is it currently in production or is it typically used for R&D in development? So, I mean, there's, there's several cars currently on the market uh, already with LiDAR scanners. Um, and, and really earlier in the history of AEB, right, uh, several companies used very simple non-scanning LiDARs uh, to do emergency braking. And if you're just speaking for Mercedes, right, we, we do plan to bring a scanning LiDAR in the new S class with the level three feature. Okay. Uh, here's a question regarding SOTA uh, for software that's downloadable. How can you decide to what extent of testing is required for a given re software revision during development versus production vehicle? Uh, I'm not completely sure if I understand the um, like the link to the downloadable software <laughs> um, because like in general for me it. It's basically the same if the user can download a software by himself or if we like change the software uh, in the production. Um, the same testing would be required from our side. We would still need to have the same confidence that the software is reliable and uh, the systems work as designed, no matter if the user decided or the customer decided himself to download it or if we just flashed that new software um, in our production plan. So that's at least, um, I think many, most car makers uh, feel like safety is a very important part um, in their release process. And it doesn't matter which way the software gets into the car. It's yeah, important. you just validate to the latest level of, of the current software rev, right? Exactly. So we have the same requirements uh, for new softwares, no matter if it's like flashed over the air or in the plant. Uh, what do you see are the main challenges for ADAS and AD, uh, ADS? I personally think that um, that's exactly the topic we have already started to talk about. Um, to find this compromise between systems that are getting better and better and still showing the customer the system limitations and that he cannot like fully trust on the system as long as they are not designed that way. Um, so I think that that's something that is a major challenge in particular, if you think that systems are getting better and better and that they, they can deal with more and more situations, still showing the customers where the limitations are. And that like, if you think of level uh, 0 to 2, that he's still in the driver's seat and he still has the responsibility and he cannot fully rely on the system. Any other comments from you guys? I totally agree with Melvin. It's about press calibration, uh, right? And making sure that people understand exactly what the system can do. Um, and I think, like she says, as things get better and better, I think that there will be a motivation that the car is driving itself. But if the car could do that, the automaker would be selling it, that it was doing that. So it's important, right, to, to sort of balance that and I think also to, to sort of play with the driver monitoring uh, factor that it's really dialed in correctly, that it's not a burden to use the feature, um, right? But that it, it does still have a value add for the customer in the end. Okay, yeah, actually one question just came in to piggyback off of this particular subject uh, with regards to operational design domains and educating the general public. Do you guys have any thoughts on how you think uh, OEMs can go about doing this efficiently? Uh, I mean, we see misabuses of the system almost weekly. <laughs> so um, any thoughts on, on, from, your, from your side on education? I think there's certainly a, a tool that could be used to, to enforce an ODD by the system, right? This is typically a trait that's reserved for levels three through five, uh, where they need to know certainly that they're inside their operational design domain, but I think you could start to enforce that in, in level two, and you could also do it through customer education, right? That this is a feature intended for use on the, the highway 
uh, for example. Okay. Uh, question regarding uh, edge cases and some of the most difficult to, to replicate or handle. Um, any thoughts uh, from your experience uh, in, in testing? Uh, I, would, I would give three things from my testing and I'm sure Melanie has some of her own. Um, but I think if we're, since this is SAE SoCal, I think some of the, the most unique edge cases that we see are really the unique uh, road surfaces and, and lane marking patterns that are used here, right? We, we have many roads that, for example, do not actually follow the MUTCD in, in markage, in signing. Um, and then we also have very light road surfaces that, right, in some cases with the right environmental conditions actually really just reflect the sun into the, the eyes of the sensor and basically blind them. Uh, next would be the large amount of road debris <laughs> that we have on, on many of our roads in SoCal uh, and the great variety that you could find out there, right? It's like nothing that you could buy at the store can't be found uh, on the 405, right? <laughs> uh, and then I guess if I would take a third one, it would be the creative driving of our uh, road users. And I mean, certainly. Certain areas certainly have different behaviors. You know, I'm actually up in the San Francisco Bay Area right now. And I think you get in traffic here and everybody is really restless because they're not used to sitting in traffic. So everybody's just constantly changing lanes, right? And I, to me, the SoCal thing is like going from lane one all the way to the exit across every lane with no transition. Um, but I'm sure there's many more examples. Anything to add, Melanie, from, from your experience? I think Lucas has already uh, mentioned the, the most striking ones for sure. Um, I'm also like always like fascinated which driver behavior you can find on, on roads in general. Um, and as I mentioned, like our systems, they have to do uh, decisions just as the driver has to. And if like a driver just drives really crazy um, and it's really hard to predict what, uh, what he will do also for like a human driver, that's also difficult for our systems. Um, so I think that that's definitely something to, to mention, but yeah, all the other um, examples Lucas mentioned are definitely also interesting for our sensors and systems. <laughs> Certainly, we, we all have experiences in the SoCal traffic and driving methods. Um, how do you plan to deal with sensor interference? Uh, as an example, radar signal interference or tunnels or parking structures or uh, some of the other physical interferences in driving. I can try to start with this uh, answer. You know, I think from the, the Mercedes side, we don't build radars or LIDARs, right? So, so I think we look to our suppliers who are implementing these features for us to work cooperatively, right? Whether it's reducing their power if they're in low speed traffic, uh, something like that. We do, you know, we have several features that have adapted performance in uh, tunnels and radar designed to detect when they're in tunnels because of radar reflections and things like that. Okay. Um, it looks like OEMs go through self-certification here in North America for ADAS, uh, but do you think there'll be a federal testing standard for OEMs in the future required as opposed to self-certified? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so basically, uh, in North America, it's it's a self-certification market. So not only for ADAS, but uh, for the whole vehicle. Um, compared to other markets where we have a third-party system in Europe, as an example, in the US, it's the, the responsibility of the manufacturer to make sure that they comply with all the FMVSS requirements, so the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. And coming back to the question, so... As, as we mentioned in the presentation, um, currently the HMC, DITSA, they are developing uh, different guidelines. And what we can see is that definitely they will transition these guidelines into regulations in the future um, that beside the testing of braking, steering, and, and all of the crash testing, which is still required also for autonomous vehicles, we will see more and more new FMVSS requirements um, regarding ADAS as well as regarding autonomous vehicles. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll take a few more and then we'll wrap it up. 
Um, question regarding, do you guys use non-deterministic simulation? I think that's a very hard question to answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, neither of us is really like a simulation expert uh, so that we can actually um, exactly say uh, if like this is a big topic um, we're using. We can definitely say we use a large variety of different uh, simulations um, from like different levels from like hardware in the loop to completely software in the loop. All our um, suppliers also use simulation to simulate their sensors. Um, and of course we randomize uh, also input parameters to have like a large variety of different uh, input parameters. Um, but I'm honestly not completely sure if this answered the question correctly. <laughs> we appreciate the effort, Mel. And uh, how important is ADAS to the future of transport in you guys' opinion? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think at a broad level, I think we're gonna, we are already seeing fewer and fewer people accepting the number of people dying on roads uh, as we have seen in the last 70 years, like we showed in the, that slide. Uh, and I think, right, you're already seeing mandated features, but I think both, you know, cities, roadways, general vulnerable road users will come to expect it. And I think people buying cars also come to expect uh, the second pair of eyes uh, to keep them safe. Okay. And I think this last question, we'll throw it out there to you guys as a panel. Uh, how do you see the increased use of AI to influence uh, the verification and validation processes for ADAS? I personally think with uh, the increasing use of uh, AI in those systems, verification and testing will become even, even more important. Um, even though, of course, we already have like all the standards and everything, uh, we have like our um, testing procedures, I think with increasing AI, as AI is much more a black box than maybe the conventional algorithms that were used in, in systems before, um, it's even more important to be sure that whatever the input parameters are, that the output is still correct as designed. Um, so because for AI, it's, it's really difficult to like, if you have like a neural network and you have like a certain input, um, you can't say with just like logical thinking what the output would be. It's, it's basically learned and it depends on uh, what exactly it learned. Um, and that's why I think like verification, testing, validation will definitely be very important as well when it comes to AI. Okay. Well, I think we should wrap it here uh, as we are almost 90 minutes into the webinar. Just wanted to personally thank you three for your personal time and the content of the presentation. Um, any last messages or words of encouragement for the general public? And then I'll just queue up our, our closing slide. Um, I think to any students who are in attendance, uh, I've found it to be a very rewarding uh, field to work in, right? I think it's really easy to ground your work into real effects that you have on your customers and on, you know, other sort of non-willing traffic participants. Um, it's really fun. <laughs> okay, and for those students looking for MB opportunities, uh, you guys want to take a chance to give a shout out to the career website? Yeah, I think it's mbrdna.com backslash careers. <laughs> um, but yeah, we they sometimes have internships uh, in our Long Beach office and rarely uh, the full-time hire. So you have to really watch out for one of those. <laughs> okay, and, and Stefan for TÜVSUIT? Yeah, definitely. I think it's uh, www.tüvsuit.com and then slash uh, career probably. Um, but also as Lucas mentioned, uh, we also uh, basically uh, we are, 
across a thousand locations worldwide. So wherever you see yourself uh, in, in the future, uh, I definitely believe that Tufsuit is um, located there. So feel free reaching out. Um, and uh, we are also working across all kinds of industry segments from uh, manufacturing um, through consumer products, um, mobility and so on. So feel free reaching out. Great. Well, thank you three. Um, we really appreciate it here at SAE SoCal and uh, thanks for your time and efforts. Um, and then just some last minute housekeeping items for our participants. Again, we have some upcoming activities in May or June. We're trying to nail down uh, webinars for additive manufacturing as well as SA J3300 automated driving standard. Uh, we're, needing, we're in need of volunteers for Formula SA for our Nevada competition. Um, and then last but not least, those interested in membership to our section, uh, you can reach out to myself. My name is Delbert Boone or Dean Case and our email addresses are listed at the bottom of the slide. Uh, membership at sasocal.org or meetings.tours at sasocal.org. So that brings us to a conclusion for this evening. Thank you everyone and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the near future. Good night.